Hey guys, Scarlet 97 again. This time I'm going to review of the antique 160 scale Gelgoog from the original Gundam series. And I say this is antique because it's not snap fit. You will require glue. What you won't need for this, at least not really, is paint. Because as you see him right here is how he's going to look straight out of the box, just glued together. So we get gray for the arms, the legs, the head. We get green for the entire torso and the skirt armor. Then we get dark gray with slight of a greenish hint to it for the kneecaps, the bottom of the feet and the inner workings of the head and also for the accessories the beam rifle uh, the beam naginata which is on the back and one thing that will require some painting is the shield which is just molded entirely in green but other than that for such an old kit it's actually surprisingly good because the base model itself doesn't require any painting at all anyway what will also require painting are of course the naginata blades what isn't quite as good as the coloring is the articulation as expected head goes bit up bit down rotates around about that far of course no mono eye movement the arms rotate around go up about that far, I'm trying not to break anything off, will rotate around below the shoulder, but eh, it's very tight there and I really don't want to risk ripping the arm completely off. Elbow articulation, well I can safely say that this is probably the worst articulated elbow joint I have ever seen and that almost includes the seat no grades because really this has the elbow articulation of a seat no grade and for anyone who has never built one of those they don't have any elbow articulation at all well the hands rotate around they're on ball joints will wiggle around turn around and everything a ball joint does then the waist does have some articulation rotates around all the way there is a good reason for that because you are actually supposed to take the top completely off in order to put in the batteries. So that's where they're stored. That's where they stored the gimmick on this machine, which was actually a very smart decision on their part. Then the legs go forwards about that far, backwards quite nicely, and they go outwards. But yeah, not really a lot. The knees are marginally better than the elbows. Yeah, saying they're better, it doesn't really say a lot now, does it? Then the feet, backwards and nudge, forwards and nudge, and that is your lot. So it's safe to say that the articulation is kinda there. It exists, you don't really see it at all really other than the main points of articulation in the arm well in the shoulders and the waist other than that well I guess you can kind of get him in a bit of an action pose but other than that it's not really going to happen now is it so let's quickly move on to a much happier subject the accessories and you get pretty much anything you'd expect with the Gelgook and it all works very well. The beam rifle, dedicated trigger finger hand with two fingers on the trigger as the anime actually shows it. Simply remove the hand. And the cool thing is, you actually have a polycap joint in here and it just slides in here. Which is probably also something important to mention but Unlike some of the very early antique model kits, this one does have polycaps for the articulation. And one important thing when building the beam rifle is do not glue the stock of the beam rifle because it's very important that thing is still movable uh, once you put it in the hand because it's, well, it's going to look kind of off when you have it like this. Not super off, but when you just want to point it straight forward, you can just bend this around and have it like that, but you could also kind of 
force it, though it doesn't really like to do that. And then, well, as I said, you can have a very rudimentary action pose like so, but that's the most action-y you're gonna get out of this machine. Then, on the back we have the Beam Naginata. Also an important thing to do with the Beam Naginata is if you're planning, well, if you're not sure uh, whether you want the Naginata in the hand or on the back, it's very important that you leave the top bit unglued. Uh, just use a super glue trick uh, to make it uh, fit in here so they can still remove it, but it's going to be solid enough to keep on there because you're gonna have to slide it into the hand and there's a poly cap inside there in which you have to feed it. So it might be a bit tricky to get in there. There we go. Now just got to get it out the other side. That didn't sound too good, but I got it through. And then of course we get the two blades but the minute, once again, uh, the same story as with the end. If you're not sure whether you want to use the beam blades, don't glue them in, but use a super glue trick. Uh, use a super glue trick to make these ends a bit more thick, so that you can put them in there, but you can still remove them. There we go. It does look a bit uh, thin and unintimidating in those giant hands, though. So let's. Quickly remove this again and make some room for the final accessory, the shield. And this is going to come with yet another part you shouldn't glue. The handle for the shield. But surprisingly enough, this actually stays together pretty well, even though it's entirely a glued together kit. So once again, you're going to have to fill around a bit with the hand and get these inside of that poly cap. There we go. Simply put the shield on there. And this is with a poly cap, so it's not going to require any gluing. Simply put it on there and hope the hand is strong enough. Come on. There we go. So the cool thing is, yeah, the connection of the shield itself is pretty solid. And, well, the hand holding onto the shield is very solid. But the wrist is currently um, being a bit of a pain, so that's gonna require the super glue trick. But other than that, if you just apply the super glue trick there, he's going to hold on to the shield relatively well. And up until now, that really wasn't that big of a problem. So come on, get back in there. Nope, that's not really going to work. So let's do the other option we have with the shield. Take another piece, put that in there, turn it around to the back and here you can see that we can store the shield here and this is where we're going to store the beam naginata. Just one kind of stupid thing they did is there's a hollow part here on top or on the bottom and this is a clamp design so easiest way to get it to completely clamp on there is do it like that and then put on the shield. There we go. So the cool thing is even though it is an old kit, they did take into account uh, storage on the back, which is really a cool thing they did with the Gelgook. And it also comes with a few more accessories other than the weapons. Most importantly, the commander antenna which is something I always love to see with the Xeon mobile suits. So you can choose to make it the normal MSA, MS-14A, Galgook, the mass production type, or the MS-14S, the commander type slash a prototype version. And the reason for this is uh, that this is included is because it's an exact remold of the Shars Galgook, which means that we not only get a normal pilot figure, but also a Char figure. Especially for the time, I really like the detail on them. Like little uh, lines at the sides here. And he does seem to have been shot in the back, unfortunately, but hey. And even Char seems to have quite a hole in his back, but when you look at him from the front, it's very nice and done. You can even see, distinctly make out Char's mask. So that is 
really nice job they did with these two minifigures. Unfortunately, we do only get one base for both of them. And then we get this, a battery compartment. And what this is for is, it's actually built to accommodate a, li a light up mono eye. Unfortunately, this skin, this thing was built back in 1980. So what was in, well, what you were supposed to use was some kind of light bulb, I think, which would probably be quite fragile and not a good idea to put a lot, well, to put in the box with all the plastic. It wouldn't really be that much fun to open your box only to find a bunch, a bunch of glass shards hiding in there. So uh, you're gonna have to provide your own light bulb. Maybe you can get an LED to work with this, but have fun figuring that out if you want a very nice light up mono eye. As always, the inevitable question is, do you want to buy this? Well, at 2,500 yen for a 160 scale, it isn't super expensive, but the one thing probably everyone is already aware of, there are a lot of different Gelagooks in 144 scale and 100 scale, which look absolutely badass. So if you're just looking for any Gelagook, well, you know which ones to get. Go for either the Mass Grade or the High Grade. But there is still an argument to be made for this big old clunger here. First of all, it definitely has something charming about the retro look of it. I mean, the huge hands aren't really that good looking, but overall, for such an old kit from 1980, it's definitely looking good. If you look at some of the other stuff we got back then, or just look at the RX-78 II from that time, even the 160 scale, not the best looking thing. Uh, so considering the time it was released in, it's a good looking model kit. For today's standards, well, it has the retro charm about it. So that is something, it's, it's charming. On top of that, it's the only Galagook you can get in 160 scale. Of course, alongside the Shars Galagook and the Galagook Cannon, which are from the same time. So, those three Galagooks are the only ones you can get in 160 scale. When you look at the old uh, Zaku, well, there's of course the Perfect Rate. When you look at the Dom, there's the Glorious series. But the poor Galagook never made it to 160 scale in any other form other than this guy. So, if you must have a Galagook in 160 scale, I would say that this is something you can definitely consider. I wouldn't say go ahead and buy one immediately, but if you're looking at this Galagook now and you're thinking it looks kind of nice, then I would say go ahead and buy one. If you're into the charm of it, if you're into the retro look of it and you really want something big, you're a big fan of the Galagook, it's something you could, you could definitely pick up. Do keep in mind, however, the box is pretty big, so you might have to pay quite a bit in shipping uh, for what it is worth. But other than that, it's a very cool addition uh, to a collection. And for 160 scale, the size still makes it look pretty intimidating. And also, let's get in with some size comparisons. When you put it next to the old Zaku 2, for example, you can definitely see that the Galagook has one of the better molds out there for the old 160 scale figures. Though, the Dom here is still one of the best ones in 160 scale. For the old 160 scale, of course. Then here it is next to the Perfect Rate l -Strike Gundam and Perfect Rate Unicorn Gundam. As for the l -Strike Gundam, they are about the same size which is good because in real life they would be about the same size as well. The Galgook for pure head height seems to be slightly smaller, but then when you include the mohawk thing on the back of its head, it's, it seems to be then slightly bigger than the Ailstrike. As for the Unicorn Gundam, if you look closely enough, you'll be able to tell that the Unicorn Gundam is slightly bigger than the Galgook, as he should be. And finally, here is next to the 144 scale, Zaku 3 and Jim Custom. And well, that's all for this very old review, and see you guys next time.